especially when he's 85 years old, we have to know and understand. Caleb understood who he was. He understood who was for him. He understood that there would be nobody else that would be able to stand against him because of who was for him. Uh, in Dr. Paul Brand's book, in his image. He writes this very awesome story about his mom. Have it, has anyone ever read this book before in his image? He writes this story about his mom, who was an awesome lady. She was a missionary to India. And when she was 75 years old, she fell and broke her hip. And she didn't know what to do. She sat there for two days in pain, sitting around and waiting and sitting around and waiting. And finally, she had a couple of men put her in a van and drive her to the nearest doctor, which happened to be an hour and a half away, on extremely bumpy roads. And as they got there, and, and as the doctor tried to set the bone back into place, they realized that the bumpy roads had damaged her more than what it would have been to bring the doctor to her to set the bones in place at that point. And so her son goes to visit her. He says this, he said, I visited my mother in her mud-covered hut at the age of 75 with a broken hip. Unable to stand on her own two legs, I suggested that she retire. <laughs> yeah. She turned around and looked at me and said, what value is that? If we try to preserve this body just a few more years, and it is not being used for God, of what value is that? So she kept on working. She kept on riding her donkey until she couldn't ride her donkey anymore when she was 93 years old. And the reason she couldn't ride her donkey anymore when she was 93 years old was because she kept falling off of her donkey. <laughs> and so she continued on until she passed away finally at 95. The last two years of her life, she had a couple of Indonesian men carrying her in hammocks from place to place and place to place. What good is this body for if it's not being used for Christ? So we pick up in our series today in Joshua chapter 14. We'll be looking at verses 6 through 15. But what we see here is, is what we find is Caleb at 85 years old. This is literally 40 years after Moses promised him a piece of the promised land. And this is 40 years after what we talked a little bit about last week, after they had gone into the promised land to investigate, and they came back to give their report. And so this is Caleb, and this is what he was saying. A delegation from the tribe of Judah led by Caleb came to Joshua at, Gal or at Gilgal. Caleb said to Joshua, remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me when we were in, yeah, you guys hang on to this word, <laughs> Kadesh Barimia. <laughs> I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me there to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave an honest report, but my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. For my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. So that day, Moses solemnly promised me the land of Canaan, on which you were just walking, will be your grant of land, and that your descendant and, and of your descendants forever, because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. And so he goes on to say, Now, as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well. And as he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise, even while Israel wandered in the wilderness, today I am 85 years old. I am as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on that journey. Man, that sounds a lot like my grandpa. My grandpa is 80, and the dude still mows like 15 yards a day. <laughs> I hope I am as strong when I'm 85 as I am now. I am as strong now as I was the day that Moses sent me on that journey. And I can still travel. <laughs> Get this one. Not only travel, and fight as well as I could then. So give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. You will remember that as you will remember that as scouts we found descendants of Antioch living there, in the, and they were living in great walled towns. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land 
just as the Lord has said. I'm going to stop here for a moment. How many people are 85 in here today? Any 85-year-olds? Any 85-year-olds? No 85-year-olds in here today? How many of you are 55? Yeah, 55-year-olds? All right. How many of you feel 55? <laughs> um, how much of this passage of Scripture, when you're hearing Caleb talk and requesting the land that the Lord had promised him, how many of you hear that 75-year-old woman in his voice? How many of you hear that lady that I talked about at the very beginning? How many of you hear him saying, I'm still ready to go. I'm still ready to battle. I'm still ready to do the things that are necessary. I'm still ready to serve you, God. I'm still ready to go. There's several things that I want to point out about Caleb in this passage. Uh, he was called to the promises of God. See, something interesting about Caleb that you probably don't know is, is Caleb wasn't an Israelite. He wasn't an Israelite. In fact, the word Caleb back then uh, in, in their language meant dog. And dogs were ceremonially unclean and couldn't be presented to the Lord. But somewhere along the line, Caleb fell in line to follow God. And in that culture, anytime that you came to the Israelites, you actually became part of their genealogy. They actually accepted you in. So you actually see this group of people accepting Caleb in. And it's strange to me to think about, you, you, you see Caleb, and he's one of the spies that Moses sends out. And here he is, 45 years later, standing before Joshua going, remember this land that Moses promised me? I can still go in and do all those things that I could do when I was 40. And not only can I do those things because I'm healthy enough and I'm willing to, I can do those things because God is with me. God is with me. At some time, he had joined himself to Israel, and he embraced God. And in that moment that Caleb embraced God, he made that the lamp of his life. He did not view anything else in the world as something that he was going to follow. God was it. It was anything that God said to do, he went. Anything that God said he could do, he believed. Anything that God said to go forth and make happen, he was going to go forth and make it happen. And it didn't matter how old he is. And so now you're probably sitting there saying, Pastor, what's your point? My point is, is this journey never ends for us. It continues on. It goes on and on and on and on. I don't care if you accepted Christ yesterday or 50 years ago. The journey as a Christian and the journey as what, for what God is wanting us to do as Christians is something that we need to be willing to do until we draw our last breath. Even if that means we live to be 95. I really don't want to live to be 95. That would be miserable. Breaking hips, having people carry you around. Have, you know, having people carry you around. <laughs> Maybe I do want to be 95. Anybody want to carry me around today? Blake? Blake? <laughs> I'm glad she threw you out there so quick. You're not going to carry me? All right. <laughs> Fine, be that way. But there's something that we can learn from Caleb. There are several lessons that we can learn from Caleb. The first one is, the first lesson that we can learn from Caleb, since he wasn't an Israelite, he was actually considered not part of God's people. Now, we've all actually been there, right? We've all been considered at one point in time not part of God's people until we accepted Christ and then we became part of God's people. You guys have so many things in, call, in common with Caleb already. We're just going to get along with Caleb just fine. Um, Caleb, though, one thing that Caleb definitely was, Caleb was an extremely hard worker. Caleb wasn't, Caleb wasn't okay with just sitting around it's kind of what we talked about a couple of weeks ago with uh, my friend that went up in his lawn chair in the balloons. He's not fine. Caleb isn't one of those guys that's just fine sitting around. 
Caleb is the type of guy that literally for 40, for 40 years, for 45 years, he sat and waited for this moment. Don't you know at some point in time when he turned 65, when he turned 70 years old, don't you know that the thought process had to be going through his head, you know what, I'm getting kind of old, I don't know if, if this is happening. Where, when is this going to take place? When is this going to go down? Well then, finally, at 85, he's sitting there and he's thinking to himself, you know what, I can do this. I'm ready for this. God has prepared a way for this to happen. I have God with me because if God is with me, who can be against me? Because don't forget, a giant is anything that stands between you and where God wants you to be. So Caleb's giant, in some aspects, was his age. He wasn't going to let his age get between him and where God wanted him to be. He wasn't going to let the fact that there were mighty armies and giants and walls and different struggles and things in the promised land that were going to, he wasn't going to let those things stand between him and where God wanted him to be. You see, because Caleb, the second thing that I want to point out to us with Caleb is, is whenever he became one of them and whenever he became one of God's family, he had a new perspective on life. He had a new perspective on life. See, things change for us when we go from being lost to being found. Things change for us as people when we come to a place in knowing that we are following a God who goes everywhere and, and serves everyone and loves everyone and who provides and takes care of everyone. But here's something fun that Caleb understood and knew about God. And this is the most important thing that I want you guys to grab onto today. So don't miss this. God is never going to ask us to do something that he hasn't given to us already. So God comes in. He saves you. He saves you. He gives you this heart. And all he asks for in return is that same heart. God gives you the ability to speak. All he asks you to do is give your all to speak about him. God gives you the ability to love. All he asks in return is for you to give everything in love. God gives you the ability to serve. All he asks for in return is all your strength and all your ability to serve. So God, in other words, is asking us for our all. But don't forget the most important thing. God has given us his all. And Caleb's perspective changed because he understood that what God was asking him to do wasn't impossible because there isn't anything that God is going to send you to do that you can't handle. But also, God is never going to send you to do something that he hasn't already been there. And he hasn't already experienced it himself. And then he hasn't already seen how the outcome will end. Because God knows everything from beginning to middle to end and beyond. Next week I have a really cool illustration for you that I'm going to talk to you. Because I try to, we're going to try to see, we're going next week we're going to try to see, or maybe not next week since we're doing baptisms, but the week after, we're going to try to see what eternity looks like. We're going to try to actually put a measurement on eternity. It can't be done. I'm going to let you know that ahead of time. But I'm going to try to give you a really cool illustration of how great it is to know that there is no way to measure eternity. Because you do realize, because what Caleb, the next thing that Caleb found in his perspective is, is he served a limitless God. He serves a God that has no limit. He serves a God that is so far out there and stretches so far wide. That we don't even understand and know what his plans are because he is a limitless God. There is no place that can hold him down. There is no structure that can keep him in. And Caleb's perspective changed whenever he started to realize that a God that was calling him out to go there was a God who had already been there. How many of you have fear of what God might be asking you to do? He's already been there. He already knows. Don't be afraid 
to go where God is asking you to go because God has already been there and he already knows and he would not call you there if he knew you could not handle it. God knows. Fear not, for God is with you and if God is with you, then who can be against you? There is nothing in this world that can stop you when God is with you. Okay, so you might die. Even if we're going to go that far to the point of death, do you really lose? Do you really lose? You get to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. I think you win that one. Not 100% sure. Okay, but here's an even better question. How many of you are scared of heaven? I'm scared of heaven. I'm scared of heaven. There's some things about heaven that I'm scared of. You know why? Because I don't understand and know what's there. I know that Jesus is there. I know that love is there. But what else is there? What else comes with heaven? What else comes with heaven? How many of you are scared to come to church sometimes? Some of you are scared to come to church sometimes because you don't know exactly what you're going to get here. <laughs> and that's okay. We do that on purpose. <laughs> I want you a little scared. Scared you is a better you. <laughs> I'm scared every time I come to church. I'm not going to lie. I'm scared every time I walk in here because... I don't even know what I'm going to get. Caleb's perspective on life also changed because God gave him different standards to live by. See, you're a Christian. Those of you who are Christians here, you're a Christian. You have different standards to live by. And Caleb understood this. Caleb understood that he had different standards to live by. And sometimes we look at these standards and we think, oh my goodness gracious, they're rules. More rules. They're not rules, they're standards. Just like leaders are held to a higher standard, Christians are held to a different standard. Why do Christians get attacked so much whenever we mess up? Because we're held to a different Christians are held to a different standard. Right, wrong, and different, it doesn't really matter because it's not about being right or wrong. It's about following God, and you're following Him to a different standard than what the rest of this world lives by. Because I think most of us in this room will confess and admit that we live in an extremely flawed and messed up world. Amen? Amen. But we follow a limitless, perfect, loving God. Amen? And when you follow a limitless, loving, perfect God, you are just held to a different standard. And when you are held to a different standard, your perspective on life changes. You see the world differently. You see the world as a flawed world, but you don't see it as a flawed world that can't be changed. You see it as a flawed world that God can save. When you are living by the law of God and when you are living by the standards of God, there is hope flowing throughout the entire world. Hope, 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 hope by the boatload. Not loss, not confusion. I mean, how, how many of you have ever been in that situation where you felt hopeless? There has been no hope. There is no hope to get through this situation. But when you are serving a limitless, loving, compassionate God, there is hope flowing all through that. And Caleb understood it. Caleb understood that hope. The third thing. Caleb had unfailing perseverance. You got to be. When you wait 45 years for the land that was promised to you, you've got to have some kind of perseverance. But let's be honest. He was 40 at one point when it, all this started. And then when he got to 85, men, once we get to about, and I learned this from my dad, and I also learned this from my grandpa, once we get to about the age of 55 to 60, there isn't going to be much changing our mind, right? <laughs> I mean, we're set with where we are and what we're doing, right? Ladies, if they're not going to say amen, you can say amen. <laughs> we, there's this perseverance, though, that Caleb had. And this perseverance wasn't over a piece of property. This perseverance was over a lifestyle. 
He has this perseverance and this understanding of knowing who God is. He knew who the light was in his life. And he could persevere through anything. Age, giants, walls. Um, let's fill in some blanks for today. Pornography, alcohol, um, spending habits. Um, fill in the blank there. For whatever your giant is, you can persevere through all those things with God's help. Without God's help, there's not a lot of hope there. There's not a lot of hope there. But the minute that you insert God into the equation, it's like algebra almost. And I was horrible at algebra. But the minute that you insert God into the equation, there is all kinds of hope. Life plus God equals hope. Life plus God equals hope. But he persevered, and he was willing to give God his all. He was willing to give God whatever he had. I love this. I found this. President Eisenhower told this tale. An old farmer had a cow that, we, that he said, my dad and I wanted to buy. We went over to visit him and asked him what the cow's pedigree was. The old farmer didn't know what pedigree meant, so we asked him about the cow's butterfat production. He told us that he didn't have any idea. And finally, we asked him, if he knew how many pounds of milk the cow produced each year, and the farmer shook his head and said, I have no idea. But what I do know is, is she's an honest old cow. And she will give you all the milk that she has. That's what God's asking for. He's not asking any more from you than what you can give. What can you give? So let's go back to the opening question. Who are we? Who are we? We're loved by God. That's who I am. That's who I am. And if God's willing to do that, and if I know who I am, then I'm willing to give everything that I am for God. And Caleb did that. Caleb did that. A giant is anything that stands between you and where God wants you to be. I'm going to read this to you. When I sit down and write stuff, I'm never quite sure how it's going to come out. But as I was writing this this week, I realized I was in an extremely holy moment. Conclusions are the hardest things in the world to write when it comes to sermon writing. Right, Brother Terrell? Yes, I learned that in Brother Terrell's class, actually. Conclusion is the most difficult thing to write when it comes to writing sermons. But listen to this. Caleb learned a valuable lesson when it came to this matter. Often, our greatest fellowship with God is found in the place of our greatest struggles. Where the giants in your life loom the largest is where God is the most present. Where the struggles of your life continually tear you down is where you should be able to find the most peace with God. Caleb understood because of the perspective that he had on life and who he was and who his God was. He understood that it didn't matter it didn't matter where he was or who he was fighting. If God was there, he was in fellowship with God. And the outcome at that point does not matter. When you are in relationship with God, you cannot lose. You cannot lose. Have you ever had that same change in your heart that Caleb had? There was a point in his life where something changed completely for him. And maybe it was when they went into the promised land. And maybe it was when he heard from God, even in the face of fear and in the face of danger, he heard from God, if you go with me and you take me with you, you will win. And maybe that's when his life changed. But at that point in time, he started trusting in God always. Have you made have you made the promises of God the light of your life? 
Have you made the decision that wherever you want God, whenever you want God, no matter what I'm up against, no matter what I'm facing, no matter who's trying to tear me down, have you made that decision to step out and step forward on faith and on courage because you have this different understanding of life than what the rest of the world has? What is it, you know, we always talk about Christians, we always want people to ask the question, what is it about you that makes you different? We want people to ask us that all the time. But what I've often found is, is as Christians, we really never had the answer that, for that question. We want people to ask it because we want to be living in a way so people will ask it. But whenever people do ask that question, we're not 100% sure what the answer is. But let me tell you what my answer is. My answer is, is I am loved. By God. That's who I am. That's who I am. And the bigger, the, the bigger thing is, is sometimes we feel like it has to be better than that, right? There's got to be more than that, right? It can't be that simple. Well, sure it is. Why isn't it that simple? I mean, you remember what it was like when you didn't even know that God was there. Then what was it like when you realized that you were genuinely and truly loved by God? Boy, that's a, that's a big difference. That's a game changer. That's a world changer. That gives us new perspective. That gives us new hope. That gives us new strength. That gives us new energy. We can pretty much face any day and any challenge that comes our way when we realize that we are loved by God. And honestly, that's all you need that will enable you. Because when you go and you face struggles and you realize that you are in fellowship with God, you don't even have to fight those fights because God fights those fights for you. And not only does he fight those fights for you, he's already been there before you. He went there and he was there long before we even thought about going there. Long before he even asked us to go. Let's pray. I'm going to have the band come one more time. And they're going to play one more song. And in this time, if you'd like to come and pray or kneel at your seat and pray, this would be a great opportunity to do that. As your pastor, I'm very excited about what God is doing in our church. If you are sitting here listening to this this morning and realize, you know, I'm not there. This isn't where I am. I'm not in that place. This would be a great time for you to come and try to figure out if that's where you would like to be. If you'd like for me to come and pray with you, I will kneel down here with you and pray with you about whatever you need prayer about. Maybe there's someone in this room that has been teetering on the edge of, you know, should I get baptized, should I not get baptized? And this is the time and the place that you decide, yes, I want to get baptized. Maybe that's, maybe that's the time that you need to pray for that down here. Maybe there's something happening in your life that you are struggling with, that you can't let go of, that you feel like you can't defeat, that you're, if the time has come and you're ready to let it go and you're ready for God to take that off your plate. You can come down here to these altars and leave that here. You can leave that at this place and let it go and allow God to start using you in a new way. This is a safe place. And it's a place where giants can be defeated because God is here. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together, Lord. Thank you for the way that you are moving and working and shaping. Thank you for your compassion and your love and your forgiveness. You are an amazing God who... You have no boundaries. You have no limits. But Father, we do. We have boundaries and limits that sometimes the fears and the struggles of life keep us from going where you want us to be, Lord. So I just pray, Father, that you would come into this place, enter our hearts, enter our minds. Help us to shake loose of the fear and help us to follow you. Help us to go in the direction that you want us to go. And not just today, and not just this week, but for the rest of our lives. Help us to live for you. 
Because if this body is not being used for you, Lord, what purpose is there? Help us, Father, to be used by you. Help us to be open and willing to go where you want us to go. Help us to be open and willing to look above our giants so that we can see you and the plan that you have for our lives. Father, I pray for the one in this room who needs you the most. I pray, God, that you would be with them and wrap your arms around them. Father, I, be for, I, I pray that you would be with those who are going to be baptized next Sunday. What an amazing thing to hear how you are moving and shaping and shaping in people's lives, Father. We love you, Lord. Thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for this time of prayer. Send your blessing in the holy name we pray. And all God's people said. Would you please stand?
was very much lived this way. Our lives should be very much lived this way. You can have the money. You can have all the toys. You can have all the addictions. Give me Jesus. Yeah. You can have all the houses, all the boats. You can keep your pain. You can keep your suffering. Give me Jesus. Who am I? Who are you? I'm loved. That's who I am. Do I deserve it? No. But he gives it anyway. And I give in return by saying, give me Jesus. Heavenly Father, that's our prayer today. Lord, we need you. We want you. Give me Jesus, Father. Thank you for this good day. Thank you for this time of worship. We love you, God. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. Go in his peace. I love you.